Okay, uh, so hello everyone. I'm Katrine Mikkel and I work for the CTRL. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, before we get started, I wanna mention a few things. Captioning is available for this session. To turn on captions, there should be an option at the bottom of the screen in the Zoom toolbar that says show subtitles. If you don't see it, you maybe need to click on more to see that option. There will also be an anonymous survey posted at the end of the session as a QR code that you can scan with your phone and also a link in the chat. CTRL really appreciates any feedback because it helps us to improve our programming and help us better support AU faculty. With that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to our presenters. Thank you. Thanks, Katrine. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome to our session today. My name is Mac Crate. I'm the name on the bottom there. Um, I'm a teaching and learning specialist here at CTRL, and I use they, them pronouns. You'll get a chance to hear from each of our panelists, uh, Michelle Lansigan, who's in chemistry, Sharon uh, sabat Gadam, who's in uh, public administration, and then Adam Tomaszewski, who's in literature, a little bit later in the session. But first, we're going to start with some guidelines for participation and a little bit of background around uh, the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning Research so that all of us are on the same page for the rest of the session. So our guidelines for participation today are that we ask you, as always, to make yourself comfortable. Feel free to use this space however you need. Feel free to stim, rock, fidget, knit, craft, whatever you need to as needed. Um, you can be present and participate in a way that works for you. So that could be using the chat, that could be video on, that could be video off. However you'd like to participate, uh, we welcome all forms. You can always feel free to ask questions and or share ideas in the chat. We'll be monitoring that and bringing those questions up to our panelists. Um, if you'd like to speak, though, please do use the raised hand function, which is under your reactions tab so that we know that people want to speak because um, sometimes it's hard to see with all with only a few uh, Zoom boxes open. And then, as always, please be generous with your knowledge and respectful of others' knowledge. If you've been in a CTRL workshop before, you know that we're probably going to start with a warm-up question to activate people's knowledge and get people a little motivated and ready for the session. So what we'd like you all to think about, uh, when, especially when it comes to the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, what are some aspects of your teaching or student learning that you're interested in learning more about? So we've got uh, a response from Sahil here in the chat. Um, so Sahil's interested in learning how students perceive the use of rigid rubrics. That's a really interesting question, Sahil. I think we have uh, a lot of research that students really enjoy rubrics, but uh, or students appreciate the use of rubrics, but rigid rubrics is an interesting component to add. Um, We've also got Alyssa from First Year Advising, uh, interested in learning more about AU support for doing teaching research projects for non-tenure track faculty members. That is a great, uh, great question there, Alyssa. I'll note that all of our uh, panelists are actually non-tenure track uh, teaching uh, faculty members. Um, so one of the great resources that we have for non-tenure track faculty members is our uh, Scholarship of Teaching and Learning Fellowship, which we'll talk a little bit more about towards the end of the um, session, but each of our panelists is actually either has been or currently is a uh, scholarship of teaching and learning uh, faculty fellow here with CTRL. So great, um, you all can keep thinking about these things that you'd wanna learn more about with respect to your teaching or student learning as we go throughout the session, and maybe you'll even get some ideas from our panelists and the projects that they'll present. 
Uh, our learning outcomes for today, so what we hope you'll be able to do by the end of this session, is to reflect on the importance of researching best practices in teaching and learning through the lens of the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, which we'll abbreviate as SOTL, and articulate the initial steps involved in developing a SOTL project, including identifying research questions, selecting appropriate methodologies, and accessing relevant resources and support networks. So our outline for today is we'll do a brief overview of SOTL so that everybody's kind of on the same page and has a sense of what this uh, discipline looks like. We'll then, our panelists will share brief overviews about their projects and what they did and what they found. We'll then move into a set of prepared questions for our panelists, following up with audience questions, and then ending with resources and references for you all. So we'll start with that brief overview of SOTL. So what is SOTL? What is the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning? So a good definition of it is that it's the systematic study of teaching and learning practices in higher education with the goal of improving student learning outcomes. So essentially, SOTL is research where we systematically assess our teaching practices. In the same way that we systematically assess any other aspects of the things that we study, we can also systematically assess how we teach and how students learn. There are a lot of components of SOTL research, and so a few that I highlighted here are that it is research-based inquiry, right? So it's going to involve conducting rigorous research that allows us to investigate various teaching methods, learning strategies, or interventions that we may place in classrooms. It also has a lot of components of reflection and evaluation, so it uh, encourages us as instructors to critically reflect on our teaching practices, as well as assess and evaluate their impact on student learning. And then finally, as is the case for all research that we do, um, we always want to disseminate and collaborate with folks on it. So we want to disseminate our findings out into the broader SOTL research field so that we can help other people um, utilize evidence-based practices in their teaching and also collaborate between and among educators, as well as even potentially with students to complete these projects. There are a lot of reasons why you might want to engage in SOTL. Um, some are more uh, obvious, some maybe are slightly less obvious. One of the key aspects is that it helps us improve our teaching practice, right? So we can develop various reflective teaching practices. We can identify effective pedagogical strategies that help us reach our students and reach our students better. So to that end, it helps us improve student learning and we can tailor our teaching methods to uh, the students that we have in our classes. Um, and then finally, it promotes faculty professional development, right? So sharing out research and uh, contributing to the field is really important when it comes to SOTL research. And also it allows us as instructors to integrate our teaching and our research. I think a lot of folks see teaching and research as two completely separate, non-overlapping circles. But what SOTL allows you to do is utilize those skills that you've developed as a researcher and put them to use in assessing or investigating various uh, teaching and student learning aspects. As is the case for most research projects, there's a general process wherein we first need to identify a research problem and questions. And so that's where that uh, initial warm up question came from, right? It's starting to get you to think about what are some of those problems that you're facing in your teaching and what are some things that you'd like to learn more about? Um, so you can think about things that you want to uh, know more about, problems that you've had with your own teaching, and then also things that um, you're just interested in, right? Something that you're like, wow, I just I just want to know more about that. Um, we then, of course, need to design our studies, and there are a few different methodologies that folks tend to use in SOTL studies, and I'll go over those briefly, recognizing that those are just some of the most common ones. There are lots of different methodologies that you can use. Um, then you want to collect and analyze your data using qualitative or quantitative methods, depending on the type of methodologies you're using. And then finally, as is the case with all research, we always want to share out our results. We'll interpret our data, draw conclusions, and consider the implications of what we found both for our teaching and future resource, uh, resource research, um, both in your own course and more broadly in your discipline or your field. So to get to at that first uh, component of identifying a research problem and research questions, there are a few different types of research questions that we see most commonly in SOTL fields. Again, these are not comprehensive and there's lots of overlap between these, but it gives you an idea of a place to start uh, because developing that research question can actually be really, uh, really difficult for a lot of people to do. 
So the, the types of research that uh, questions that we've highlighted here are what works questions. So these are questions where we're trying to determine if a particular teaching strategy is maybe more effective than another, or if a strategy is effective on its own. So these are gonna help us define and describe the relative effectiveness of various teaching and learning approaches. So for example, one of these questions could be, do students demonstrate greater mastery of chemistry content in the flipped classroom compared to a lecture only class? And this is actually a research study that one of our previous SOTO fellows, who's not a part of the panel today, but one of our previous SOTO fellows uh, investigated as a part of her research. We also have what is questions. So these are questions that are not necessarily trying to say that one strategy is better than another, but instead describing components of a particular learning and teaching strategy. So these can be questions like what factors influence students' motivation to participate in class discussions in a political science course. We're not necessarily trying to say that these are better or this is the way you should structure your class. Instead, we're trying to define those things that allow our students to participate in class. And you'll see at least one example of a what is question um, from Michelle Lansigan's research project. And then finally, we have inquiry focused on what might be. So this is kind of a, a combination of these previous two questions and also a slightly different category. So this is um, investigating what might happen if you use uh, a framework or a theoretical approach to help students understand something else. So for example, I teach in STEM courses. So what would happen if I used an object-based pedagogy in STEM course to help students develop observational skills? So it's maybe taking something from a field that isn't typically incorporated in your own field and seeing the effect of utilizing it on students in your own field. And again, um, there's a lot of overlap between these. A lot of our research questions aren't going to fit nicely into one of these categories, and they definitely don't have to. But again, it does give you kind of a place to start. As promised, uh, we'll share just briefly about these uh, various common uh, scholarship of teaching and learning methodologies that you'll see in our uh, SOTO Fellows research projects and see more broadly in the field. So we have both qualitative and quantitative types of research that occur in SOTO. So qualitative research can be things like one-on-one -on -one interviews or focus groups, and a lot of our fellows utilize these. You can also use observations, so perhaps observing what students are doing in class or having others observe what you're doing as an instructor. Um, and then there are quantitative approaches, such as surveys that use Likert scale questions. I know a few of our SOTO fellows utilize surveys. Um, you can also use assessment data, such as the data that you get from Canvas an Analytics, which tells you things like how long students have spent in your course, how many times they've accessed the course, stuff like that, that can help you answer particular questions that you may have. You can also utilize student grades, components of assessments, or really anything else uh, in there that might fall under that assessment data um, category. And then finally, there's this idea about experiments where you could potentially consider uh, comparing instructional strategies and utilizing experiments in your, uh, in your SOTL research. It is important to recognize that a lot of times SOTL studies may be comparing unequal instructional strategies. So you might compare sections of a course that where one gets exams and one gets projects or a flipped classroom compared to kind of a typical lecture only or business as usual class. Um, so when we're doing studies like that, we have to be cautious about comparing those instructional strategies if we hypothesize that they'll lead to different attainment of our student learning outcomes. We don't wanna disservice our students by putting them in a course where we think that they may have unequal instructional um, capabilities uh, because then that, uh, that um, it doesn't give each set of students the same opportunities. So if you're in, interested in conducting those types of studies, A, I encourage you to reach out to uh, us here at CTRL to help you think through these questions but also anticipate any differences in the effectiveness of teaching strategies that you may use and plan to mitigate those differences. One of the options that you would have is like having extra lessons for students who request it, things like that. Again, you can always combine these different approaches or use multiple approaches in case one doesn't work or you don't get the uh, data that you're looking for from a particular uh, approach. I'll note, um, as uh, a lot of folks know, um, Human, all human subjects research is going to require a, approval by AU's Institutional Research Board. So this is any research that uh, incorporates human subjects. When it comes to SOTL research, a lot of our research is going to be considered exempt. So it doesn't need to go through the full IRB 
uh, committee approval process, such as if you were testing whether or not a drug worked better on one population versus another. But um, we still have to go through the process of getting approval for our research, even if it is exempt. So that's just something to note if you're interested in pursuing these projects that you will need to complete a um, IRB application. So that is our brief introduction to SOTL. Um, just going again very briefly, there's a lot we didn't cover um, and a lot more to investigate. But for now, I'm going to hand it over to um, our three panelists to share brief overviews of their projects, starting with Adam Tomaszewski. Thanks. Uh, how's my audio? Does it sound okay? Great. I made the wise idea to transfer technology right in the middle of the presentation. Uh, I'm glad it's going to work out. Hi, everybody. It's it's nice to meet you all virtually. My name's Adam Tamashaski, uh, he, him pronouns. And I'm with the Writing Studies Program over in the Department of Literature. And I'm also the current faculty director of the Complex Problems in University College. So I got into SOTL because in fall 2019, I switched from a very traditional grading ecology, A to F, um, for my all my for my writing courses, and I got into labor-based grading um, under the umbrella of ungrading. And after a semester, uh, I noticed that one of my students seemed to be particularly floundering, and it led me to. And the student was an international student. And I didn't know if the floundering was the system, the new system, or just the, the person, a very esoteric set of circumstances. So as I'm wondering about what's happening, uh, I get the email, the invitation to apply for a SOTO fellowship to investigate a question about my teaching. And this was perfect. So uh, this was the question I wanted to, to get into. I was very curious if students from non-traditional AU backgrounds, which would be, in this case, I, I was thinking of students whose language, primary language wasn't English and or students um, who were first generation. Uh, most of AU students are second plus generation, English as a primary language. So I was curious if my, at the time, new grading system was somehow impacting them differently or very frankly disadvantaging them somehow and so that was the genesis of of my project and i'll just give you a, a couple of the um, the slides I, I presented on this in october 2022 at the soto research conference at kennesaw state uh, university um, i'm happy to answer any more questions if you want to get deeper into the weeds but just to give you a sense of of what what i got into uh, my research question, as I described, is, uh, you know, how are students from different backgrounds responding to the labor based system in my writing classes? Um, and in partnership with, with CTRL uh, assistance, I generated a survey. We generated a plan. They taught me how to uh, use the software and then how to begin looking at the, the responses. And for all of that, let me get down to it. Um, you can see here, it was it was a series of questions I asked to try and get a sense of the broad landscape internally and, and kind of externally vis-a-vis -vis other classes for my students. And so I also rearranged my questions so that they weren't all positive valence, you know, so that, that you actually had to read them. It wasn't just like you could click, click through. So for instance, the first question is I found the labor-based grading system easy to understand. But then the next question is what you might consider a more quote unquote negative approach, which is uh, the system led me to put less importance on individual coursework and assignments. Um, and so I, I tried to make sure that it wasn't a, a straight through, just click down the one side. And so that's sort of worth noting. I'm gonna show you the results in, in a moment. And I had my students do this at the end of a couple semesters and then I could compare it and I could filter it by um, their their language, their primary language, and by their generation of, of attendance. Um, and to give you a sense of what I happen to find, uh, I will show you very sort of briefly. Um, I broke these down by the, the generation, by the language. And so you can see here for this one uh, about finding it easy to understand, everyone from the cohort that I was most interested in, the first generation student, um, either agreed or strongly agreed. There was an outlier on the second gen plus that that disagreed. So that was where that little orange came from. Uh, when it came to language, same thing. Um, the, the cohort that is a primary other than English, 
everybody found it um, easy to understand. Um, and then again, there was an outlier there for the other one. This one is a flipped question. So you can see that's why the, the orange and reds uh, take, take precedent here. This is about putting less importance. Um, for the first generation students, by and large, they, they disagreed to strongly disagreed that they put less importance on it, um, which was pretty much in line with the second generation uh, response, responses on that. Via language, uh, unanimously agreed. Now, the, the language one is interesting. There's only a few people. It's a small N on that one. Um, and so, you know, 60 and 40, I think that's out of five or six people. But still, nonetheless, everybody disagreed that that, that it happened for them. Whereas for the primary uh, of English, there was some people that agreed that, that it did leave them put less importance, which makes rational sense. And it's what, what you actually would expect to find in the research says it's students behaving rationally. Um, so that doesn't, doesn't phase me too much. This was a question about would they have written better papers? In the old system, uh, all of my cohort that was very interested in first generation students, they all disagreed that they would have written better if they had that external motivation of grades, whereas you can see some of the second gen, there was a little agreement with that. Um, this came down to language. Um, and again, relatively the same. I think that 20% in the other than English is a, a N of one on that one. Nonetheless, it's there. Uh, this one always means a great deal to me. This is the question about anxiety. Uh, and does the system lend itself to students feeling less anxious? And it was a 100% for first generation students strongly agreeing that they felt less anxiety. Those of you that study effective pedagogy know that students' mindset inhibits or allows for learning and transfer of learning. And so if I could decrease their anxiety, that to me was a really important takeaway. Um, a little lingering second gen, but by and large, they all agreed or strongly agreed. And then we came to uh, language. Uh, again, there was an outlier of one, but otherwise agreed or strongly. And then uh, for, for primary of language, again, one little outlier, everybody else strongly agreed. Would you take it again? Uh, no matter the, the cohort, everybody said they absolutely would, which was my final question. Uh, so that's a quick little overview of what I did. I definitely could not have done that without CTRL's uh, guidance and, and mentorship on that. And I'll be happy to answer more, more specific questions um, at the Q&A later. Thanks, Adam. That's a great overview um, and a great uh, project. And if you could send me those slides so that I can share them out with our participants afterwards, uh, that would be awesome. All right. Our next uh, panelist who will share her research is Michelle Lansing. Thank you, Mac. All right, can you see my screen? All good. All right, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Michelle Ansigan, and I'm a term faculty in the chemistry department. And I was a CTRL Swiddle Fellow for 2021 and 2023. And my research is on investigating the impact of using pop culture in introductory chemistry classes. So I teach a course um, called um, Chem 100. This is Chemistry in Everyday Life. And here we introduce students to the practical applications of chemistry in every aspect of modern life, from the food we eat to problems in healthcare, environment, um, law enforcement, technology, everything. Um, this is a habits of mind class and my students are generally non-science majors and I have a large class size of about 48 students per semester. So as you can see, I have students who are not really into science and so they would typically come into the class board <laughs> generally not interested having this really negative perception that chemistry is difficult it's laborious it's challenging and not relevant to their field so i want to change that perception um, i want them to leave my class at the end of the semester having a better appreciation of chemistry as a subject so I noticed that whenever I would introduce um, pop culture elements into my lessons, students start to perk up, they start chatting, you know, there's more engagement and so on. So just for example, before I introduce the concept of the periodic table, I would show them a clip of Iron Man 2. And here, Iron Tony Stark is being poisoned by the palladium in his arc reactor. And in the movie, his solution is to basically make a new element. So they show him here, um, in his tank top in the basement of his mansion using a wrench and um, Captain America's shield to balance out his homemade um, particle accelerator. So I tell my students that this concept is actually real, but that's not how we make things. 
this is how, how we make things. So I give them this pop culture reference before I introduce the you know, science heavy concept and students become really more interested. Um, another example I could give is we use vibranium and I actually got this idea from a ChemEd conference that I attended where uh, Professor Collins used vibranium and um, asked the students to map it out in the periodic table. So we used the same thing. I asked my students if vibranium was real, where would, where would it be in the periodic table and what would be its electronic configuration and things like that. So I just saw like creativity flowing, the critical thinking, you know, came here. It should be here because it's this. It should be there because it's this and so on. And so we extended that to other fiction elements like adamantium from Wolverine and Valyrian steel from Game of Thrones. Where would they be in the periodic table? So students become really interested. And they also use uh, TikTok videos and YouTube videos to introduce um what is an ionic compound? So we have here dogs teaching chemistry. And one of the most difficult things that students encounter in my class is a concept called stoichiometry. It's very math heavy. And so just think of that as something that's abstract and really difficult because of all the math. So I asked the help of Spider-Man um, in this case. So students, um, you know, they find it difficult, but then they laugh at the beginning. They, you know, chit chat with their classmates and things like that. So I said, this is something that's working, but I want to have more structure to how I incorporate it. So there's a lot of studies um, conducted about this, how to use pop culture to engage students in the chemistry classroom, but not a lot have focused on best practices. So for this total project, I have two research questions. Um, how can integrating pop culture references in a general chemistry class affect student learning and engagement? And what are the best practices for effectively integrating these references into my Gen Chem courses? So with the help of CTRL, I conducted a mixed methods um, survey. So I have a class survey deployed via Qualtrics, and Mac helps me a lot with this focus group interviews. So we collected data for over two semesters. I'm just going to show you a brief overview of what I have learned so far. So I have 19 respondents for spring, and I have about 30 respondents for the fall. Um, it's very difficult to see here, but the strongly agree is this one. So the color the color schemes can be quite confusing. But some of the questions we ask is, um, did students enjoy the use of pop culture in the class? Um, did they um, use examples to their, uh, that they can uh, apply in everyday life? Um, did the pop culture references help capture their attention? Did it help them develop critical thinking? Did it help them link um, theory to everyday activities? Did they did this references help improve their understanding of the course materials and so on? As you can see, majority of the students think that this uh, pop culture reference actually really helped. Um, some key takeaways from the narrative portion and from the um, um, focus group interviews are uh, there's also very, it's, uh, it's also surprising for me. I didn't. Um, realize that it helps students feel more included in the classroom. So there's a lot of these responses. So for example, they say, I feel more included in the classroom. They so pop culture explains concepts in a way we understand and relate to. Um, it makes the course less scary and intimidating, and it helps them connect with me as their professor. Um, in terms of best practices, um, students heavily suggest conducting surveys, especially at the beginning of the semester, to ask um, what pop culture um, references are they familiar with or interested in, and then regularly ask students for feedback so that I can adjust my materials accordingly as well. Um, they would like me to use popular references and keep up with current trends to ensure that my references remain relevant and engaging. And it's surprising too, because students are not just into movies like Marvel or Star Wars. They want something that is more um, current and real life. So because of that feedback, I incorporated Coldplay into my curriculum. Um, Coldplay, um, most of us probably in this age group are familiar with them, but they use heavily sustainable practices in their concerts. So they use kinetic flooring, for example. They harness the energy from the movement of the people to power their devices. Um, they, the wristbands that they use for the ticketing, they recycle that or they get that back after the concert. And then they let the countries know, like Japan gave 95% back and so on. So, you know, things like that. And they want me to incorporate it also into assignments. So one assignment that I used, for example, is I showed a clip of the Martian. So Matt Damon here is stuck in Mars and he has to create water from whatever he has. And we just used 
the equation for making water um, to use that into stoichiometry problems. And so it was difficult, but they found something that they can relate to by, by seeing that movie. And so when I use movies and, and clips, they want uh, the students suggested that I show a short preview or a clip as a refresher for those who have watched it or as an information for those who have not watched it so that everybody would be at a level um, playing field. And they also would like me to incorporate quizzes or games based on popular game shows like Jeopardy to make the class more interesting. So I learned a lot uh, you know, from this total project. And I would like to thank CTRL for helping me with this, especially Mahak, who's been really very supportive about this. And I'm happy to, um, I'm excited to share uh, my findings at the upcoming biennial conference on chemical education. This is going to be in July at the University of Kentucky. Awesome. Thank you so thank much, you. Michelle. Um, this is this is great. And I think uh, both of your else projects highlights how, you know, having a specific research question and then you have a problem and you want to figure out something that addresses that problem. And I think that's where a lot of the SOTL research comes in. So our third uh, panelist here is Shirin. And I'll note that um, both Adam and Michelle have kind of gone through the SOTL uh, fellowship. Shirin is still in her first year of the fellowship. So first off, congrats, Shirin. And thank you for still participating, even though you're in your first uh, first year. Um, but we'll also note that uh, being in your first year of the fellowship, Probably don't have quite as much as Adam and Michelle. So just wanted to give that background there. So feel free to go ahead. Thank you so much, Mike, for the introduction. And hello, everyone. My name is Shirin Sadat Adam, and um, I'm a term faculty at uh, DPAP or Department of uh, Public Administration and Policy at SBA. And um, it is, as Mike mentioned, it is my first year as a uh, CTR. Well, I learned a lot from Adam and you know, Michelle when they were presenting, so it's it's awesome to see uh, all of the work that you know they um, you know they have done. Uh, I'm still in the very early uh, stage of my research, but um, so going back to what my question is, um, so we are all living in the era of AI and uh, technology, use of technology in the uh, classroom, and one of my concerns. Um, as an educator and a professor in the classroom is seeing the students uh, that, you know, they are using the technology in the classroom and, um, you know, how many times they are getting distracted while they are using the technology in the, uh, in the classroom. Um, so, you know, using uh, technology in the classroom is inev uh, inevitable. And um, so based on the definition of the SOTAL uh, or, you know, one of the criteria in the SOTAL is, you know, um, concerning about the equity and, um, you know, using technology in the uh, classroom is, um, you know, something that, you know, has to do with the equity about um, access of all the students and we can avoid it. On the other side, we have the distraction issue that uh, we see that, you know, students, while they are listening to the lecture or while they are um, you know, um, typing and, uh, you know, they are taking notes, uh, they get distracted by the notifications, by the homeworks that they are due from other classes, um, uh, with uh, the messages, uh, and sometimes, you know, with the tempting, you know, shopping um, deals that they are going on uh, online. And, you know, sometimes it's very easy to, um, to get them distracted. And I, uh, um, and all of my students are grad students and our classes are block classes. So uh, sitting in a class for three hours and a half, um, you know, it's not that, uh, you know, that fun. And, um, you know, I see that the students easily get distracted. Um, so I was thinking that, so this is a very good topic to, um, to dig into that. And, uh, you know, my topic is about uh, optimal use of technology uh, in the classroom, how we can uh, use technology in the classroom to achieve a higher level of learning. And uh, on the other side, you reduce uh, reduce the distraction of the students. And I'm using, you know, lots of, um, you know, interaction in my classes, you know, I'm using, you know, Kahoot, I'm using pop culture, I'm using um, Jeopardy, uh, and, you know, um, so, uh, you know, we all all using, you know, different types of activities. Uh, and polling and so on in the classroom. And um, so right now I'm uh, in the process of the survey and you know I had a survey, I got the result um, of their survey from my classes. 
and um, I'm at the stage of analysis, uh, analysis uh, and you know, I want to just analyze that right now. Also, uh, I would like to you know learn much more about that from um, the university point of view, and um, so that's you know uh, one of the things that uh, you know I would like to conduct during the summer. So if it is possible that you know I send out you know my survey um, to the whole university. Um, to see, you know, what is, um, you know, what is faculty idea about that and what is other students idea about uh, the use of the technology. So, for example, some of the questions that they have is about, you know, suggestion that, um, you know, either students or faculty have about, you know, mitigating the distraction from the electronic devices. I think, you know, one of the good source is uh, students themselves uh, that they can, you know, contribute to that. Um, and you know they may have you know great idea about you know how to use the technology to to um, you know also take advantage of that and reduce the distraction from that. Um, so I'm at this stage and it is an ongoing project uh, and hopefully we will get some good answers soon. Great, thanks, Shrin. Um, and I'll just say I'm very excited to to see what happens from Sharon's survey. She uh, sent them out to her students this semester, so kind of in that analyzing data phase. So we'll see what happens and hopefully get some great insights into how to mitigate those distractions that come from technology um, that we all experience, I think, and uh, as we, you know, continue to to utilize virtual spaces. Um, so I think I'm going to adjust the the order just a little bit. Um, so I wanted to see if, since our panelists just shared their projects, I wanted to see if anyone had questions for our panelists about any aspects of their projects um, before we move into the prepared questions, just since they're probably fresh on folks' minds. Um, so if you do have a question, feel free to raise your hand and unmute or uh, pop it in the chat and where you can read it out there. And if not, we'll move into the prepared questions. Yeah, go ahead, Sahil. Yeah, thanks, Mac. Um, thank you for those very interesting presentations. I was really uh, wanted to learn much more about each of your projects. I had a small question for Michelle. So one thing that struck me and strikes me about using pop culture is this aspect of students getting the references, right? That's something essential that's required for them to be able to learn and achieve the overall student learning outcome. Um, was, was there a sense from your inter from your focus group interviews, or did you get any comment which reflected that maybe learning that pop culture reference is additional work for the students? Did it constitute an additional burden that they needed to learn about that pop culture reference in order to learn more about chemistry itself? Was that sense ever present? No, so we didn't get that map, right? In any of their student responses, that wasn't an issue at all. They felt like, because when I, whenever I dis, uh, disperse this pop culture references, either I give like a very good background about what it is, and a lot of the time students are very familiar with it. So it doesn't feel like a burden to them. For them, it's something like a way to connect with the material as well. So that wasn't really a question in that aspect. Okay, thank you so much. Other questions for our panelists? All right, we're just making sure to give enough of a pause in case uh, folks need a little bit more time to process. Um, so I think uh, if we don't have any other questions for our panelists, we'll move into our prepared questions. Um, and our, our first prepared question was what inspires you to engage in your research? But I think you all got a lot of that from our panelists presenting their, their research projects to you all. So I won't ask you all to share that uh, information again. So we'll start with um, the question, how did you approach your project? What did you do first, second, third, et cetera? And how did you stay on track? And anybody can feel free to jump in. Go ahead, Michelle. I guess I can start with that. So the first thing I did was to conduct a comprehensive literature review first to understand um, 
what existing studies on interviewing pop culture um, have been out there. And this is uh, this step is crucial to frame my own um, research questions. And then next step is I collaborated with, at the time it was Erin um, Horan at the time. So we already find the research question and then we try to develop a research design. So that's when we decided that we're gonna do surveys um, for this part. And then I completed the CD training, which took longer than expected, but it took me about you know several months to complete the training, the certification to ensure that all the research practices met ethical standards. And then I worked closely with Mac um, to finalize the survey questions and the focus group questions, um, taught me how to use Qualtrics, how to incorporate that into my um, classes and so on. And then just all throughout um, this project, I had regular meetings with Mac to keep me on track. And, you know, we always have um, checkpoints as well to make sure that I'm still on track within that two years of the total fellowship. And basically, yeah, that's that's uh, how I tried to frame the entire total project. Yeah, just jump in. So similar to what you know, Michelle mentioned, um, you know, at the beginning I started with a lit review, and um, then you know we had a monthly meeting with Mac, which was very helpful, and um, and still is you know is ongoing. Um, so we are waiting for the you know survey to be done, and um, so then you know we're gonna continue our meeting. Then uh, you know I went through that. Um, so I created a survey. We double check it with. Mac and um, we went. Uh, I went through the IRB training, similar to Michelle. And uh, the next step was distributing the survey. And uh, I'm at that point that you know, um, so getting the result. But you know, uh, Mac was a very good you know point to uh, to keep me on track. And you know, it was you know every um, you know every milestone that you know we had you know be. Uh, we had a collaboration and back and forth to make sure that uh, you know everything is going as smoothly. Yeah, the only thing I, I would just really emphasize is the importance of that opening literature review. I did the same thing. Aaron was essentially my Mac uh, of of the time. Uh, but it's it's really useful to know what ground you might might even need to stake out or not stake out, as the case may be. Um, and so not only was the, the CTRL guidance from, from Aaron so useful in that, and it turned out there wasn't really much done at all in looking at different populations within, within things. So my, my ground was wide open. But even like getting through the IRB, uh, workshopping that language before I sent it in so that the first time it went, it went up before him, it got, it got approved right away. Um, Aaron had given me some really good feedback on, well, you want to word it this way and avoid mentioning that. Cause that's not actually what you're doing. Uh, and it was just, it was so useful to have that guidance through. Uh, and then once I got to crafting my questions for the survey that I showed you again, Aaron helped me with that, like just wording it so that we really made sure the data I was interested in was the data we would get from it. Uh, and that was essentially the process was just sort of working through the creation of that, the language and then processing it. Uh, and it was it was very smooth in that that respect. Great. Thanks, everybody. Um, so I'll note for those of you that don't know this, the city training that folks are mentioning is the ethics training. So if you've had ethics training at another institution, um, these are usually like asynchronous modules that you kind of go through and uh, answer some questions about to prove that you've gone through the modules and, and gotten that training. Um, so if you're interested in doing a, a scholarship of teaching and learning research project, um, it is important to go through that training. And as Michelle mentioned, it, it can take quite a while. It's a bit arduous of training. Um, so starting earlier rather than later is always a better uh, better option there. And at the end of the session, I'll share with you all those resources where you can request uh, SOTL consultations, either with um, our teaching team or with our research methodologists, uh, Tiffany Monique Quash and Eric Schuler, who work with folks in developing their methodologies and analyzing data. So you, um, even if you are not a SOTL fellow, uh, you still have access to all of these uh, similar types of resources. All right, so our next question here is, um, what have you learned about research, teaching, or service from engaging in your SOTO project? How has your SOTO project influenced your teaching values or strategies? And can you share any specific examples of changes you've implemented as a result of your research findings? Uh, 
recognizing that everybody's in a different stage of their project, so some folks may not have uh, findings yet. I can jump and start with this one. Uh, you know, given that what I was really curious about was the the effect of of this this for many students new teaching ecology uh, on their experience. Uh, I've used my findings because what I've discovered uh, were two interesting things. One, uh, I've I've continued to have these conversations with students as we've gone on from there. Uh, I find that I am working on being even more explicit and hands on, walking students through what the system looks like, um, what it means to be labor-based grading versus the old sort of days of subjective judgments of quality. Um, and so students who are international, especially, they've appreciated where in our opening office hours, I will walk them explicitly through what it might look like, what a semester looks like. I'll give them a sample student um, and we'll figure out like, for instance, what would their final grade be in this new system versus, versus the old system? The other thing that, that has been really interesting, you saw some of that in the, the charts that I showed, Students from our more AU traditional background, second plus gen, English as a primary language, um, they have, and, and other research has spoken to this, they've got, um, again, most of them really like the system, but there is a, a train of thought through that population that is a little squeamish about changing what they know well, even, even if the change is done for them and it's done for their mental health and it's done for their long-term pedagogical success, they're so familiar with I get a grade on every paper, right? And that's how I understand my personal worth, right? That the system actually unsettles them a little bit. And so even with them, I need to strive to, to be clear about the rationale, the principles behind the system, and then the practical side of the system, um, because they're having a different kind of struggle in that so many of, of our own, I'm thinking about my, I've got a junior in high school, freshman or fifth grader. I've seen this, like so many of you are familiar with students pre-college. So much of their internal worth is tied to grades and the approval system of grades that when they walk into a, a system where I'm just like, grades are terrible, aren't they? And they're not useful and welcome to a labor-based system. And aren't you so thrilled? It can be a culture shock that that really gets in the way of what I'm trying to give them. And so I need to remember the concreteness and the explanation of principles behind the system and explanation of the system and then practical application of the system so they can see it. So with the, with the SOTL project, it brought all of that to light in really tangible ways. So yeah, it definitely has given me concrete changes to what I did pre and post the project. Yeah, I can, I can go next. The same thing with Adam. I learned a lot from conducting the social research. I've learned that you know students are more likely to really engage deeply with the course content when it intersects with their interests and experiences. And this project has also um, reinforced my commitment to student-centered learning. So seeing firsthand how the changes in course content can influence the engagement and learning, it has prompted me to adapt um, more flexible and responsive teaching strategies. So I've become much more aware of what's new out there, what's popular, what's gonna be more engaging and so on. It just allowed me to become a more um, responsive um, teacher with this, with this project. So my project is still you know, ongoing and um, so we didn't reach to the conclusion, but I hope that you know, uh, when I get the answer, I will be able to um, you know, uh, to use that in my classes to make it uh, a more effective use of, you know, technology and more, you know, optimal use of uh, technology in the classes that I have. Great. Thanks, everybody. Um, so our last prepped question here is, what advice would you give people who are interested in starting a SOTO project? I think I can go first, yeah. Um, so if there is anything you know interesting uh, about your classes that you want to explore more, you know, just go for it. So there are, you know, lots of room, there are lots of different, you know, pedagogical, uh, you know, changes that you can do. Uh, there are, uh, if there's anything that, you know, you're uh, curious about that you think that, 
uh, you know, it has a positive or negative effect on your teaching, um, you know, you can take a look at the research behind that. And, um, you know, it can be from anything from teaching a strategy to assessment of students, as, you know, Adam did. And, um, you know, there are lots of room for explore. Uh, and uh, I think you know, CTRL is a really good source for that. And it will walk you through all the steps. And, you know, I'm a very big fan of, you know, CTRL. I learn a lot from, you know, uh, CTRL over, uh, over the years. And this is a very good, um, good resource uh, that you have access to. I'll just add on which is to say i mean my initial answer is to go for it but a little more um sort of like like practical thing i'd pass along if you've got any sort of hesitancy about well and i'll just say this you know as a as a member of writing studies as a as a as a uh, term faculty member research has not been has not been my life and i thought i am such a neophyte in this um I, i'm not gonna know what to do and so like maybe i shouldn't do it because this isn't what i do that is the exact opposite of the vibe of the fellowship and and ctrl's guidance whatever you need to learn they will help you learn it they will guide you through every single step there and so it's 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 not a barrier to admittance in other words if you're uh, if you don't have a huge research background which i didn't have coming in uh it was really a welcoming experience to be sort of encouraged to pursue the thing that i didn't know how to do uh and so yeah ab absolutely go for it and don't let any sort of perceived sense of, oh, do I have the, the research background or chops for it? Um, CTRL will help give you what you need to do to succeed at it. And that the community that I worked with was so great. The people that I was in the cohort at the time, uh, it's I would really strongly encourage if you've got the least bit of interest to look into it and, and to pursue it. Yeah, just to echo what they both said, yeah, you completely captured what I wanted to say. But yeah, um, just ask questions, um, reflect on your teaching, and then maintain that curiosity about what would work and you know help your students learn in your classes. And there's a lot of things that I do not know when I started doing this other project. Like I didn't know what IRB is. Like how do we go with that training and so on? Like how do I really craft the survey responses? And Mac really helped me, you know put the wordings together, how do we conduct focus interviews, you know, things like that. So just ask questions and don't hesitate to ask for help. And as as a lot of you know, if you've engaged with CTRL before, we, we really do love helping and we love working with faculty. And I personally um, had very little SOTL experience prior to uh, joining AU and starting to help folks like Michelle with her research project. So I think what I'm trying to get at is that this is, it's a really cool opportunity to engage in research that's related to something that, that you're really interested in, but isn't necessarily tied fully to your professional um, role, right? Like a lot of term faculty aren't required to do research but you are required to contribute to the field. And one of the ways that you could do that is through um, SOTL research. Also just wanted to note, um, we got a question in the uh, chat, a direct message to me um, asking about kind of the scope of SOTL projects. So the question is, I think all of the projects presented today involved a research project that looks at the researchers own classes and teaching and their own students. And the question was, is that always the case for SOTL? And are there opportunities for collaboration between multiple faculty or um, individual faculty members designing research that can be implemented in classes taught by multiple different uh, faculty members? And so I'll note that the reason that these faculty members' research projects are uh, focused on their own teaching is because of how the fellowship works. So our SOTL fellowship is such that it's just one person who applies for it. So really that that leads you to instances where someone is going to look in on their own uh, teaching and research practices. That being said, there is a certainly SOTL research that's more broad, that incorporates multiple different, uh, sometimes multiple different institutions, multiple different uh, people within a department, multiple different courses. Um, so there are definitely opportunities to collaborate and experience SOTL a little bit more broadly, um, rather than simply just looking at your own teaching practices. But the way, the reason that you're getting that mostly from our fellows here is because that's just kind of how our fellowship works at this point. 
So that's kind of the, um, I have a few other prepared questions if nobody else has uh, any Q&A questions, but I want to open it up to our uh, attendees to see if uh, this, this really, uh, well, I guess I can't say it's a really cool discussion because I can't uh, say if how, how everyone else feels, uh, but if there's anything that came up that, that you'd like to learn more about or probe our, our panelists on, please feel free to, to ask those questions now. All right, not seeing any questions. Um, so I'll I'll ask another prepared one, which is what challenges or obstacles did you face while completing your project and how did you address or overcome them? I guess I can start with that. So I wanted to get surveys, right? But my problem is not a lot of students actually participate in the survey. So in the, the first time I deployed the survey, I think only 19 students participated and I think one or two students in the focus group uh, participated in the focus group. So the next time I deployed the survey, I really massively did advertising. So reminders all the time. And then we had um, so, 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 some sort of like incentive in the second round, which was approved by Cedar Island and, and, IR, and the IRB and so on. And so we got more responses there. So the second time I collected the survey, I had 30 participants and I got, I think, four students, five participating in the focus group interview. So that was one challenge because these are all voluntary survey responses. So it would be a challenge to get students to participate. So just advertise and um deliver the importance of what your project actually means, not only to you as a teacher, but also to other um, students who's gonna be taking your course in the future. My challenge is about survey too, uh, but you know, my challenge is about the university-wide survey. Um, I think I get you know, a fair amount of response from my own students, but uh, you know, I wasn't able to, um, you know, find a way to distribute it to the, uh, to the whole university. I contacted many different, uh, you know, places at the university, no response, and you know, um, so I tried to, you know, create at least there, um, went through, you know, many different venues, but still, um, you know, that's ongoing, and um, you know, that's a very challenging part of that. Early on, uh, when I was sort of designing it with Aaron, one of my original ideas had been to look at the the products or or look at them in terms of the work that they turned in, and then reverse engineer back. All right, well, who belongs to what cohort, and and what differences emerge from their performance there, and the mechanics of it got so complicated. Of of when would we do this, and what would I look for, and can you compare things like that? What would I even be doing? And then I had one of my, my I think we were bi-weekly meetings, whenever it was, and, and you know, Aaron asked, aren't you interested in their perception of how the course is going for them? And like, even with, the, with that sort of reminding me of what I got into the project for, I was like, that's right. And so that turned us toward the survey that then asked questions about, it asked them to reflect on their own experience in the, in the, in the classroom, which was more of what I was hoping to get, which was their experience in the classroom, which I don't think I would have, gotten the same kind of thing had I stuck with my very original plan of looking at the work itself to see if any interesting differences emerged. Um, and so that's a place where, again, working with Aaron got me over this huge conceptual hump that then dictated and, and opened up the, the rest of the way for me from there on out. So what I'm hearing from these responses is that having multiple uh, paths that you could potentially take in your project can be really helpful. Because I think what what I've learned from working with you all as SOTL fellows is that you can't really rely on any one methodology, right? Sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't. But having multiple options or multiple ideas for how you could approach your project is really, really important. And if all of them work, fantastic. You have even more data. But then if only one works, you still have something that you could work with. You still have some conclusions that you can make. 
So that's something that I try to encourage folks to do is think about different ways that they could, um, you know, answer their research question using different types of methodologies. Yeah, I think this is one of the real benefits of of how you all structure it with sort of like the the, the solo leadership from you all, but also the, the the camaraderie of the group itself. If if I can just come in with a question that I know I want to explore, but and I'm not fixed on how I think it has to be explored, then there's much more possibility for creative solutions from from you all at the CTR leadership, but also from my peers and colleagues to think about all the different ways that that I might explore it and reach new discoveries that I didn't, I didn't anticipate. So coming in with just a question can be a fantastic way to start, right? Not being so fixed on, I have a question and I know exactly how to reach an answer. It's better to go in with, what do you all think about how I might get to an answer? So I think we've lost a few folks, which is totally fine and, and pretty expected. Um, but I'll I'll let our uh, panelists, uh, if any of you all have any final thoughts or any final things that you'd like to share with our uh, participants today. And then um, once we do that, I'll just share briefly a few resources, uh, both from CTRL and beyond, and then um, a few uh, other options that you have for workshops that would be, might be helpful to you if you're investigating a SOTL project uh, for the rest of the May faculty workshops. So first, any final thoughts? And it's okay if you don't have any final thoughts. Uh, I just like to offer that space in case folks feel like they didn't get to say something that they wanted to say or have some insight that they like to share. Just the last thing I would add is, in addition to the fellowship itself, if you go down this road, do think about how you might present it at conferences. Like I, I would never have thought about presenting at that that Kennesaw State uh, Total Conference if it weren't for Aaron putting it on my radar. Uh, and so just be thinking, it might be a way for you not only to do the research for yourself, but I think, Mac, you've mentioned this a couple of times, uh, how you then propagate it out and tell other things about it. Uh, and not to be mercenary, but if you're looking for conference participation, um, it lends itself as a beautiful segue from doing this work, processing this work into then telling other people about it. And these conferences, like Michelle's about to go do it, Michelle and Mac can go do it. They're out there and they're they're hungry for what you've discovered from your investigations. And just to add that there's also a lot of journals that we can publish our work. So Mac has a list of those total publications that you can publish it to. So that's also another way to be current in the field. All right. And that list of uh, journals, there's a couple of them, and I have put them on our resources here so that you all have access to them as well. So just briefly, I'm going to share slides. Um, Again, unless, uh, Shrin, you had anything you wanted to add? No? Okay. I assumed, but I just wanted to check in. All right, so let me start this screen share and do this guy. Okay. And you all can see my screen? Okay. Um, so I just want to share a few different resources, and these will all be shared with you as a follow-up email. Um, but we do have this uh, SOTL faculty fellowship that we've mentioned a few times. So all three of our fellows here have either were uh, SOTL faculty fellows or currently are. Um, and this is open to term faculty. It is a two-year fellowship and you get direct support and money from CTRL to complete your SOTL research projects. Um, you can always request a SOTL consult with the teaching team. This is better for like broader um, pedagogical uh, like kind of thinking more broadly about your research or any questions that you might want to investigate. We also have two really fantastic research methodologists, Eric and Tiffany, who can help you uh, figure out what methodologies to use and also what um, how to analyze any data that you have. And then beyond CTRL, uh, and this is these uh, SOTL consults and the research methodologist consults are open to anyone, regardless of whether or not you're a SOTL fellow, regardless of your appointment here at AU, um, anyone is open to request these consultations. And then finally, uh, for the and beyond, um, there's a really great worksheet for kind of starting to develop and design a SOTL project. Um, so we've offered that here. 
and then two different lists of uh, journals, SOTL journals, uh, both by discipline, one from Illinois State University and one from Belmont University. And you'll be able to access all of these links in the slides once, um, once I send them out after we finish today. So once again, thank you all for joining. Um, and I wanted to highlight a few different uh, workshops that may be of interest to you all. There's this external funding research, which I say when no, today's Tuesday, uh, which is tomorrow at 3 p.m. And then there is the TAGET workshop, which is a program for qualitative researchers to analyze qualitative data. Um, and that's going to be run by Tiffany on Thursday at 11 a.m. And she'll tell us how to use that program. Um, and then finally, if you're doing um, kind of higher, more intensive computer an analysis, there is a new high performance computer here at AU. And um, Eric Schuler is running a workshop on that on Friday morning at 10 a.m. So with that, thank you all for being here today. Um, I think Katrine just put a uh, little evaluation survey in the chat and I'll share that out again over um, uh, over email once we finish today. Um, and so, yeah, thank you all for being here and for participating. And I hope you leave with some cool ideas to investigate in your own teaching.